When it comes to price discovery for utility assets such as XRP, we're gonna have to formulate a completely new recipe formula to understand where are these prices gonna be in the future, right? Because as real value investors here, uh, we have to understand this is a brand new asset class and not all cryptos are created equal, right? Some of the chains are the asset while others like XRP, the chain and the coin are the critical aspect, right? It's not just for governance, it's for other types of use cases. In XRP's uh, case, it's an exchange in and of itself, which is really groundbreaking technology. We're gonna jump into that today, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for joining me today. My name is Andrew DeVilbus. This channel is focused on enterprise grade distributed ledger technology. I'm a career investor. I do daily due diligence. This is my, my passion, my hobby, and my life all wrapped up into one. Let's get right into it today. This just, uh, you know, uh, before I get into that, right? I do want to say yesterday, me and Mr. Man XRP, the legend himself, dude is an amazing, amazing person, just a library of knowledge. This man uh, has has been such an inspiration in my life to really start to deep dive more than just the, you know, the skim the surface like you learn in the stock market with fundamental analysis, but to go through the high level in, uh, institutional documents. He was a massive, massive inspiration of mine. So, uh, Mr. Man XRP, shout out to you, man. Thank God that you're here and you're yourself and you're able to present your information in the way that you do. It brings so much value to the community, uh, myself included. So we did talk about things like the Finternet, Dex interoperability, the end user experience, Internet of Value and the Internet of Things. And we got into a lot, lot more. So next, uh, this just dropped. Linda P. Jones, apparently, uh, you know, look, so... <laughs> We all know when you really, really study the technology of XRP, the chain, the coin, everything that they're trying to do, the technology itself can absorb the amount of value it takes to get to these high prices. So that's not a question, right? Technically speaking, it could see these very high prices. Now, you guys know I'm a believer that it will see these types of high prices. But to hear it from other people, especially in people like places like Mrs. Linda P. Jones here, it just hits a little harder. So we're going to give these guys a listen. This is from James at uh, 6 at J. Uh, he, he does a, a lot of podcasts with people in the XRP community. Uh, so we're going to give this a listen. Really, And fast. when you talk currency, that's literally in the trillions per day, per wow. day. So... I don't think we can use market cap when we're talking about XRP. I think that's the wrong way to look at it. We need to look at it in terms of currency, number one. Right. Number two, I think that if you look at the Athi Michnik calculator, which is the calculator that Ripple themselves came up with, and um, one of those people is on the is over at BlackRock and in digital assets over at BlackRock. Another one, I think the other one is on the board of Ripple, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, so they're they're very involved in the industry still, but they came up with a calculator which looks at how much money flows every day and uh, from how much time in between each flow, and that calculates how much XRP could be worth. Right. Now, you know, Jimmy Valley did a whole study on uh, the values, and so there's we've had, you know, we have a low valuation, we have a very high valuation, we have everything in between. So... Mm -hmm. You know, it's not for me to say what the ultimate value can be, but I do think it is a matter of how much is flowing on the rails. And the fact that we got news that Ripple was going to offer a stable coin meant that that number just got exponentially larger because stable coins are one of the most important things to move money uh, in. If you think about how you buy crypto now and how, you know, you take it from your bank account usually into a stable coin and then into a crypto or moving it from one place to another, possibly with a stable coin. It's something we use them all the time, right? So there's gonna be a lot more flows because of that. Now, the other thing I wanna say is that um, people have written papers on the fact, uh, at least two people that I know of, have written papers on the fact that they believe that XRP was engineered to be $10,000 or more based on how many decimal points it has, how many 
uh, the hundred billion that are in existence, the drops, the whole thing. Right. Um, so that's their estimate by their research, and that's a very interesting number. Mm -hmm. um, I think that that is definitely a possibility. That's definitely within the realm of what would make sense. Right. Um, you know, how much money could flow on the XRP ledger. And when Rosie Rio says the train has left the station, yeah. I think that means that the financial system is all planned. Everything has to be planned. There's nothing that is taken for granted. There's nothing that happens by chance. When you're talking about money and changing the monetary system, every single thing has to be coordinated, planned. You have dates for things. You have go live schedules. You have all these things with the software and uh, with money flows, and they know exactly when this is going to happen. And I think that it's not a coincidence that the U.S. is the last to bring crypto laws into existence. That's because we have the world's reserve currency, and therefore the other countries are all banding together under the, the BRICS nations, and they are you know, getting a currency uh, reset into something of value again and out of fiat and that will force the largest the world's reserve currency to have to do the same thing so i think it's all planned and it's all scheduled and we're getting close to the point where it's going to become very obvious in in my opinion and when she's absolutely right guys when it comes to the price discovery of xrp it really relies on the amount of volume going through the network the velocity of that volume the transactions per second is all going to come down to a very complex mathematical strategy that is going to be the price discovery of the value of xrp right because xrp is a hub and spoke model in the center of a DeFi ecosystem it is going to have money running through it it's going to have all different kinds of use cases not just you know the original use cases that we all heard of back in the day until now but there are more and more use cases coming online daily they're going to be using this stuff for the back end of e-commerce we're about to get into a video from jazzy cooper about interoperability of the decks now i posted this yesterday ripple's very own jazzy cooper is a rock star genius she made a draw jaw dropping statement at the stable summit about interoperability when it comes to dex usage now xrpl has all the functionalities of a real world exchange and more right so i've always said that there are going to be a few core protocols that actually act as real world exchanges in this new digital frontier aka liquidity markets right because distributed Every ledger technology is a disruptive technology. That means things are going to be getting replaced or innovated on top of. Now, when it comes to blockchain rails, it's something you innovate on top of. So I could see a world where these middlemen exchanges actually all source their liquidity from one, uh, from one decentralized exchange, right? XRPL, the liquidity hubs, providers are acting as that decentralized exchange and that is the future of exchanges right all the world's exchanges all the world's banks back in systems hopping rails whatever rails they use they could hop right over and and source liquidity from xrpl and then come back to the end user now jazzy cooper is about to explain this in a way that we can all understand using a video game terminology so she's going to talk about how someone that's playing a video game on like polygon uh to say like the end user might not know they're playing on polygon but the gaming company designed the game on polygon and if you're buying something in game the game might need to know, hey, it has to make these bridges and hops to new chains to source certain tokens and certain aspects of the chain so it can perform that uh, specific use. Let's let, let's let Jazzy describe it, right? The way she describes this seamless cross-chain motion to route transactional activity to the core decks is groundbreaking and truly a massive breakthrough 
when it comes to product market fit. And I truly believe that this, what she's about to explain to you, can be implemented across the board for tons and tons and tons of different use cases and technology. You know, Let's arguably, check it out. you don't need uh, dozens of DEXs. You know, there are dozens of DEXs on each chain. And as someone was mentioning before, when a new chain starts, that chain now, now needs a DEX, which doesn't necessarily make sense. I mean, if you look at traditional financial markets, there's you know two major exchanges in the U.S. There's uh, maybe 10 major exchanges globally. And so why do we have over 60 DEXs uh, in the crypto space? So I think true multi-chain interoperability will allow for specialization. And if you are, let's say, a gamer on Polygon and you need to access a different token in order to make a purchase, uh, you can use cross-chain you know, routers and technology to execute your swap in order to purchase your, your asset. Uh, and that'll, that'll be routed to another chain, execute there for the best possible price, least amount of slippage. Uh, and then those funds and the, your, you know, your destination token will basically land back in your wallet without the user ever knowing that, that their trade executed on a different blockchain. So that's the type of kind of user experience improvements that we need to see in the trading realm. Uh, and some of the infrastructure um, you know, and interoperability players will... So that can be implemented across the board, whether it's gaming, e-commerce websites, fintechs, uh, centralized exchanges, they can all source liquidity in that manner. And she is absolutely correct. There's no need for 60 plus DEXs. All these coins and token, all these chains don't necessarily need a DEX. We need to aggregate liquidity globally so we can really make this thing efficient. That is what the Internet of Value is for, right? It, it's in the book, uh, Creating the Internet of Value. Uh, so, you know, hats off to Jazzy. She's a rock star. Um, you know, she absolutely kills it every time she gets on stage or has an interview. And she's just an enlightening person to listen to. So anyway, any way or any time you get to hear Jazzy speak, you should be all ears. Um, now... Earlier today, as I was in the gym, I was listening to the Digital Euro Conference. They had a panel on Mika regulations. Now, a few years back, now this is what this video is about. A few years back, this had everybody up in arms. They were very worried. This is really what got the ball rolling when it comes to regulations in Europe. Facebook was going to create a cryptocurrency known as Libra Coin. The European regulators and policymakers banded together to create regulations in order to stop things like this from happening. It's my personal opinion that the regulatory bar is being set very high and the bar is on fire. So crypto native companies that don't meet these rules of regulatory compliance will not exist in the near future. As investors, we use this understanding to place investments that we have higher conviction in due to the company's compliance, right? Now, notice when we're talking about compliant companies, you know, uh, Ripple down here is a sponsor. Where's their name at? They're actually right here. Ripple, Hedera, MasterCard, uh, Swirl Labs, Casper, Deloitte, all these big players that are now playing in this digital asset space, they are making themselves known and they're showing up to play ball. Let's give this a listen how all the regulations before that um, were developed. So how does Mika fit into the regulatory systems that already existed across the EU uh, countries and, and how does it fit in basically? So um, again, as Patrick mentioned, uh, there was this Libra coin which uh, was supposed to be launched by Facebook. And uh, unofficially, uh, Mika was the Libra killer uh, among politicians and some government officials that they didn't want that product to be available for the local market. And crypto market is quite significant in Europe if uh, we can raise, we could do that. How all the regulations before. So there you have it. He just said Mika was created because of the pressure that these larger social media companies were putting on them, right? We got PayPal launching a stable coin. We got Ripple launching their stable coin. We got big movement in this market and regulators have to get on board. This is a global effort. 
it needs to get harmonized like the ISO 222 compliance. It needs to be harmonized around the board. Each little uh, area of the world will have their own versions of it. But I think Mika is going to be kind of the copy and paste that we see around the world. Now, I got more from this uh, conference right here. Three minutes of absolute heat from the Digital Euro Conference, a panel speaking on Mika regulations. The panelist gets into somewhat of a debate about stablecoin regulations and the possibility of mass subpoenas being issued to any companies utilizing stablecoins in Europe that don't follow Mika regulations. Right. Again, I said the bar is being set high and it's on fire. Are your investments compliant? The last speaker, right? You're going to have to hear this. The last speaker goes on to talk about utility when it comes to crypto assets and stable coins. And that's why I love the companies I'm invested in, right? And the, and the blockchains that they're utilizing, XRP, XLM, HBAR, DAG, literally just to name a few. There's many, many more. Let's check this Greg video. Greg has out. a reply. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I support it. I, I think this is a real chance. First of July, some prosecutor in some one of the 27 member states just wakes up and thinks, wait a minute. Dollar stable coins are illegal to trade in Europe right now. So let's subpoena this exchange or that service provider or this one. So it's, it's a real risk. People are completely asleep at the wheel that there is a chance European prosecution will go after everyone who touches stable coins that are issued outside of Europe. And I really wanted to bring this uh, to attention to the audience and uh, to discuss with panelists because very few people have a, a strategy against that right now. But it's, the, the risk is definitely uh, real and significant. Just very, very briefly, a quick correction. Dollar trading is not illegal. There's no, there's no paragraph, no, no sentence in Mika that, that would say yeah, that. Basically, any stable coin that's backed by any fiat, if it's not registered outside of Europe, could be classified as an illegal instrument. So it, it's not dollar per, t per se, it's just anything that's not under Mika and issued outside, in, inside from Europe. Yes, but obviously there is, I mean, th there is ways to make also dollar stable coins or stable coins that are, you know, based on other currencies, Mika compliant. Mm -hmm. So it, the, the question is really who is compliant and not compliant and not what kind of currency is the stable coin referencing. Yeah, and maybe to just add on your point, Patrick, I, I think the the true challenge really is to to design a Mika compliant stablecoin that still has some utility and use cases that it actually gives value to this new form of money. I, I'm totally convinced that there is uh, there 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 will be forms of Mika compliant stablecoins that will fulfill this value proposition, but it's definitely something that requires some, let's say, intellectual power also by the issuers to really come up with a with a smart design that fulfills especially all the requirements on the on the AML and travel rule side, and at the same time means that it's a, that's a for example, a programmable and very uniform version of a stablecoin that is applicable in various use cases related to the Web3 ecosystem and, uh, and to, 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 to other types of crypto assets. And I believe really this will be kind of the, the yeah, very interesting to see how different issuers among the European Union will come up with smart implementation approaches, uh, also combining technical features of a stablecoin and the regulatory requirements that they are facing under MICA and all the other regulatory uh, requirements applicable uh, as they are e-money token, as they are crypto assets under MICA, etc. Uh, te uh, technical stuff. Um. I mean, when it comes to panels like this, right, the Digital Euro Conference is a think tank where all the brightest minds in this digital money space come together, talk. As you see here, they got almost into a little bit of a debate there about, you know, the regulations for stable coins and crypto assets with the Mika regulations on the horizon. Now, to get a full spectrum understanding, right? I say that all the time. I want to brand that into your brain. We need a full spectrum understanding when it comes to this market. This is a very, very, very risky market and a very risky asset class that we are investing in. So when it comes to investing here, we need a full spectrum understanding of what we're investing in, the companies, the regulations, all of it, everything 
saying we need to gather as much information as we can so we can have high conviction in our investments. Because if you want to sleep well at night, you have to know that you've put in the work, right? This takes hours and hours and hours and hours of research. When we show you these videos, this is just a little bit of an entire panel of an entire conference that lasted two to three days. Now, I don't want you to get down on yourself if you have a job, right? You have a, a, an eight hour a day job. You're already tired when you get off work, all that. Look, I got you covered. I'm not going to let you down. That's why I've created the private group. Link is in all my bios. And what we do in there is we, uh, we record our, 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 our uh, study sessions and I put it in an easy to digest form and fashion on the private group, private Patreon. Link is in the bios, all of them, YouTube, X, all that. I'll see you guys on the next one. If you enjoy this content, look at this ad, <laughs> right, uh, as I'm doing mine. Um, anyways, link is in bio. If you enjoy the content, thumbs up. I hope you guys can feel how passionate I am. I know you guys are passionate about this space as well, and I don't want you to get down on yourself when it comes to the overwhelming amount of due diligence it takes to really succeed in this market, guys. So, you know, I'll see you guys on the next one.